I just want to talk really quickly about education. And I would like to talk about the education pipeline in particular. The pipeline that we've constructed through which we you know, uh, uh, find and seek young, wonderful minds, and then we train them, we nurture them, we mentor them, and walk them through the pipeline of education, and they come out as leaders, and they emerge. And what I want to talk about a little bit is kind of the fact that our pipeline is a, a little squeaky, a little creaky, a little old, and um, which is fine, because you know we're still a part of it. But the educational revolution is coming. It's coming soon. And I hope it comes really soon, because I really would like to be around to enjoy it. And everybody, especially everybody involved with TED, with TEDx conferences all around the country, organizations like Eureka Tori that are trying so hard to catalyze this educational revolution, these industries and these organizations are, are trying to get it here sooner and get it here faster, which is fantastic. But what about the leaky pipe? What about the students that we're losing through this pipe because it's not structurally sound? What about the students that we're losing in the pipe because it's obsolete? What about the, stu what about the Michelangelo's, the Da Vinci's, and the Steve Jobs that we're losing because of this leaky pipe? That's what I'm concerned about. So yay, the education revolution is going to happen, and I'm so excited about that. But I'm more worried about slapping a Band-Aid on the leaky pipe we have right now so that the students that are in the system can stay in the system can persist in this system, and they can actually enjoy the wonderful educational revolution that is going to come and make education so fantastic and creative and interdisciplinary and integrative. So that's what I'm concerned about. So what I'm concerned about is persistence. Why? What's happening along this pipeline that makes students stop persisting and leave? What happens to make them drop out of the pipe? What happens when people don't persist? Well. Languages die, entrepreneurship dwindles, which is never very good for the economy. Education suffers. Education suffers, so why should I care? Well, when education suffers, things like this happen. I'm going to talk specifically about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, because that's the area of the pipe that's got the biggest leak right now. And I want to talk about that. So numbers have been up. There have been more students enrolled in STEM this year than there were last year, which is great, which is fantastic. Here's the problem. About half of them will not persist and leave. Half of all students that enter STEM fields leave, almost half. And actually, this is a number from 2010. And so the number's up now. I don't have the exact one, but it's about 50. Half of everybody coming into STEM who says, you know what, I want to change the world. I'm going to build a robot that's going to do it. Oh, I need to go into robotics. Oh, let me become a robotics major, leaves. How does that impact everyone else? Well, 80% of all jobs in the next decade are going to be science and technology related. Deficit anyone? Bigger problem. Technological innovation accounted for half of US economic growth in the last 50 years. Te we are incredibly dependent on technological innovation. If we don't have people going into technology, what happens to the innovation? Bigger problem. For the first time in the history of the United States of America, last year, December 2011, for the first time, it lost its lead as a global innovator. For the first time, ever. It's now number two. So we're already seeing the effects here. We're already seeing what happens when kids drop out of science and technology, when kids don't persist, when kids find fault with the system and decide, you know what, I'm not going to do it anymore. Here's the problem. So what happens? So what happens about persistence? I just want to talk really briefly about the idea that I need to do something and then getting to accomplish it. Not a straight line, by the way. Very wonky, very curvy, dips and turns in unpredictable ways, and it's complicated. I have an idea. I say, I want to save the world. I'm going to become a biologist, and I'm going to go you know, save endangered species and make this planet better. OK, great. That's my idea. How do I accomplish it? OK, let me go into college, get a degree, do some research, get out on t into the world, and do fantastic, fabulous things. OK, that's, my, that's what I've got to accomplish. Now I've got my idea, I'm motivated. I go, OK, great. Let's start moving. I hit the first snag. I go, you know what? It's OK. It's OK. 
I like my idea. I keep going. I keep going. I keep going. I hit the second snag. This time I lose a little bit of myself. And I'm like, ah, that hurt. Remember, I haven't accomplished anything yet. But I keep moving. I'm like, you know what? This is important to me. So I keep going on. I keep moving, keep moving, hit the final snag. And then I now am really hurt. I'm hurt because it looks like I'm not going to make it. Very logically, it looks like I'm not going not to make it. So you know what? You know what? Maybe this is a good time to bow out. I hit another snag and I go, OK, done. Done. That's it. Moving on. I stop persisting. What happens? Well, the thing is, for the first half of my journey, just having the guts to do it is enough. Just having the guts and the drive to do it is enough for me. I can make it through those first set of challenges. I can make it through those first set of hurdles. Even if everybody else tells me, you know what, that's kind of stupid, I'm still, I'm still almost high on the concept of my idea. And I say, it's, it's OK, I'm going to go on. The problem comes with the second part, which is pure, 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 pure persistence. Guts, not enough. Not enough anymore. Because you know what? I haven't accomplished anything. I seem to only lose myself in the game. Dips and turns, I can't predict them. Don't know what's going on. And people are telling me I can't do it. Things are c cropping up where I'm losing confidence in myself. And this is not just about the drive or the motivation. It's about persistence in the face of everything telling you you can't do it. You can't do it, Dania. Gosh, don't you know this already? And I go, ah, OK. <laughs> and I listen. Now, why do some people persist, though? How is it easier for some people than others? Well, it comes down to the idea that they truly believe, completely believe, that what they're doing is worth it. They go, you know what? The entire world could tell me no, and that's OK. Because it's worth it. And this means something different to everyone, but it's worth it. It is worth it. Whatever happens to me, it's worth it. I am going to persist no matter what. Some people, what's worth it for them, they, they know. For a lot of people, they don't know. So for everyone that knows what it is they're fighting for, they make it. They accomplish something. It comes down to something called a reward. It could be tangible. It could be intangible. It's just something, an idea in my head, maybe. But there's something that says, you know what? When you're done, you get this one thing. And that makes everything OK. That's where persistence comes in. You persist because of the reward. So what happens when you throw a reward into the equation on this crazy con you know, map over here is all of a sudden, I don't necessarily need my own personal drive and my own personal internal guts to do it. All I need is this reward to go, oh, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to keep going. And aha, yay, I accomplished something. <laughs> when you throw in the reward, you can make it through the hurdles. That's great. So OK, that's how people persist. Got it, understood. So what's the reward in education, especially in STEM? Wisdom, you know what? I get to know stuff, so when I go to a dinner party, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Maybe it's the degree. That piece of paper I get at the end, you know what? That means something. That validates my five, six years in college, and that says, hey, you mean something to the world. Congratulations. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's the fact that I really, really want to have a career. I say, I want to grow up to be an astrophysicist. And that means something to me. I want to send things into space. And I go, you know what? I want a career. I want to make money. I want to climb the corporate ladder or go into entrepreneurship either way. And you know what? That's important to me. So these are some of the three biggest incentives or rewards that people have, especially when going through college, right? Yeah? I'm going to stand here and stare at you until you answer. Yeah. OK, great. So. Now let's go and talk to some of the graduates from 2011. This is a survey that was conducted last year when everyone was graduating in May. 65% um, of graduates think their degree was worthwhile. That means over a third of everybody sitting at graduation, cap and gown and everything, don't think it was worth it. The, and this is obviously not including the kids who never made it because they dropped out. 
43% of graduates feel that they'll actually secure a job in what they were going to school for. 43%, that's less than half. So even the ones who think, oh, this piece of paper means something to me, don't think they're actually going to get a career out of it right away. So what happened to the incentives of education and the rewards of education? Kind of flopped a little bit. They're gone. <laughs> what we consider a reward in higher education doesn't count anymore, clearly. Kids don't think it counts anymore. So what now? What do we do? So what's the reward in higher education? Well, I'll give you a hint. It's in the title of my talk, ideation. The process of forming ideas, not the process of taking ideas, not the process of being given ideas, the process of forming them yourself creatively, thinking about things, coming up with your own concepts, your own ideas, and running with it. Let me make something. Let me come up with something. Let me invent something, imagine something. Let me do science that looks a lot less like this because let's face it, anybody who's a scientist will tell you that science is not this structured. Science makes mistakes, things spill, things break. Things, science especially, especially is not as transparent as that beaker up there. It's complicated. The best scientists have actually been corrected by modern scientists. Newton came up with some really iffy theories. He's still brilliant. Because we, in science, it's OK to make a mistake. It is. Science is chaotic. Science is crazy. Science is unapologetic. Does that look, look like it's unapologetic to you? <laughs> science is like this. It's chaos. Science is chaotic. Why is it that we can't tell a kid who's going to school for science that it's OK to make a mistake? Things spill. It's OK. Beakers break. It's all right. You come up with a kooky theory, you'll be Einstein in 2025. Let, why can't we just tell people that? Let them come up with their own ideas. Let me do something. Let me do something with my hands. Let me actually get my hands dirty. Let me do something with my hands and my head. Let me think. Let me think for myself. Let me dispute you. Let me question you. Let me come up with ideas that don't make any sense right now. Let me do something with my hands and my head where I can muddle, I can mess up, I can freak out, and end up with a thing that's all mine. Let me do something with my hands, let me do something with my head where I can muddle, mess up, freak out, and it's OK, but I end up with something that's all mine. It's mine. It's my idea. I just created something. And you know what? I love that process. That process, let me understand what that is. Let me believe that I can do it. Let me fall in love with what's really great about science is that 90% of it was at some point science fiction. Let me get to that point. Let me understand that. Let me do it enough times. Let me do it over and over and over and over again. Give me three hours per semester, even if you want. But let me get it every semester. Let me do it every week, every month. Let me do it so I do it without you asking me to. But let me do it enough, enough in a workspace where I can actually just put something together, blow it up, and see what happens. Let me do something where you ask me to think about concepts that don't exist yet. Ask me to come up with relevant problems. Ask me to come up with reasons why I don't even understand what you just taught me in circuit analysis, too. Let me figure that out, and let me tell you about that. Let me do it enough that I fall in love with the process. I fall in love with the idea of generating ideas, and I'm unapologetic about it. I'm OK with making mistakes. I'm OK about it. Because you know what? I have so many of these. If I have 99 really bad ones, I'm going to have one really good one. And you know what? When you're all you know, six feet under, the 99 ones that seem to be bad are probably going to be true. So let me be OK with that. Let me come up with that process. Let me understand that I can come up with my own ideas. Let me do it enough times that I fall in love. And then the reward in higher education is no longer the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. 
It is the rainbow. It's a recursive reward. You don't need something at the end. You get it every time you go to class. You get it every time you go to work. Guess what? I love going to class. This is the part where all the dots that you saw before, they all connect. Thank you very much.